All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Public Safety Committee meeting for Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. I'm Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez, the chair of our Public Safety Committee. And uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Calling the roll for the Public Safety Committee. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember O'Farrell. I am here. Councilmember Buscaino. Good afternoon, here. Councilmember De Leon. For the record, is not present. Council Member Harris Dawson. Present. Four members present. You have a quorum. Thank you so much. Madam Clerk, would you please uh, call the uh, announce the call in information for today's meeting for members of the public who wish to speak on any of the agenda items? Certainly. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-586-7607 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for a participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Thank you so much. And uh, colleagues, we're going to take uh, 45 minutes of public comment. Uh, before we uh, begin commencing the work on our agenda items, so uh, we will start calling. We will start calling on these callers. For the record, I would just like to add that Councilmember DeLeon is present. Thank you. Caller with the number ending in zero eight. I'm sorry, zero nine one eight. Please press star six to unmute yourself. If your number ends in 0918, press star six. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi, and good caller. afternoon. My name please. is Paul. Hi. Yeah, just let us uh, state My your name and the items you'd like to speak on, please. Very good. My name is Paul Armstrong, and I would like to speak on Council File 19 0603. I'm, okay. I'm and speaking on behalf of the. Go ahead. One minute. Yes. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of the American Wood Council. The American Wood Council is the voice of the North American wood products manufacturing industry, prov providing information on wood design and regulations for the whole construction industry itself. We are a very important uh, stakeholder and appreciate being involved in this process. We've reviewed the revised motion, and as that stands, we do offer uh, to assist the Department of Building and Safety and LA City Fire in any way that we can with any questions they may have about wood construction. It should be noted, however, that the California Building Standards Commission has recently adopted a new supplement to the California Building Code that will be effective July 1st of this year. That supplement will include the uh, tall wood criteria uh, that is based in the 2021 International Building Code. The California State Fire Marshal has indicated his support of the tall wood criteria, as have two governors, Newsom and Brown in their process of adopting this. This criteria Thank itself you. has passed very... Thank you so much, caller. One... We appreciate you calling it. Yeah, it's one minute. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 1506. With the number ending in 1506, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Good afternoon, Chair and members. My name is Diana Coronado, representing the Building Industry Association. We are opposed to item number one on the agenda. We are deeply concerned about wood construction being prohibited by expanding Fire District 1. Last year, California passed regulations to encourage increased wood use for home building. Even the state fire marshal recognized that it will increase the pace and scale of woodland fire prevention and forest management goals. Also cited were the positive environmental benefits. The safety of workers is also paramount in construction. Wood is far less harmful to long-term health when compared to other materials. We are encouraged by the idea of amendments, and if a report by city departments were pursued, we ask that it include alternatives to expansion of Fire District 1 to meet the outlined goals of life and fire safety. We uh, did review, we would like a review of housing costs associated with ex expanding Fire District 1, and we would like to be a part of a formal stakeholder process. As an association of home builders, we can tell you with certainty that wood construction is the most cost-effective method to build homes. 
stopping wood construction would increase costs for homeless, affordable, and all housing during a housing crisis and stands to make Angelinos less safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next caller with the number ending in 4024. The number ending in 4024. Press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. I'd like to speak on all items and general public comedy, please. How many much time I have, lady? Thank you. Oh. You have two minutes uh, for the items and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Thank you, Momo. Now, I want people to know on item 19, I do not support. I'm an animal. And animals need wood to survive in the cold elements of nature. Just like people need a home, like Kevin DeLeon Assembly Bill. No place like home, jackass. <laughs> so, I concur that the obligation of you people there for public safety is to reduce criminal crimes against woodpecking on trees. The only woodpecker in the world I see is you, Kevin DeLeon, and you, mommy, mommy, moo, <coughs> moo. Now let me go to my general public comment because other speakers wish to speak. May I speak now, general public comment, mommy? Go ahead. One minute. Thank you, big girl Monica. Why is Nuri so fat? She needs to go on a diet. That's why she gets so upset and hangs up on people like she did to Mr. Eric Previn today for the record, you stupid cunt, fat bitch. All that cake and sugar makes you hyperthermic. And you make mistakes by hanging up. No. Uh, it's your uh, fucking uh, uh, Shut the fuck up. I'm speaking, you stupid son of a bitch. Uh, Stop uh, interrupting me. I know. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. No, it's not Spiller, you fucking cow. Oh, no. Oh, no. Thank you, Mr. Spiller. Again, no off topic. Not appropriate okay. for this community. This time is off. Next caller with the number ending in 8421. If your number ends in 8421, press star 6 to unmute yourself, please. All right, uh, thank you, you very much. Act, please state your name and the My items you'd is, like to speak on. That's a hard act to follow. <clears throat> My name is Larry Williams. I'm executive director of the Steel Framing Industry Association. And I would like to talk about item 1. Okay, you have one uh, minute. We very good. We represent dozens of companies in the manufacturing and construction industries with thousands of employees in Los Angeles who have over generations been essential to the development of this great city. We strongly support building a safer Los Angeles motion because it will do exactly that, result in a safer Los Angeles for all the families of my member companies and all Angelinos, and ironically produce a safer Los Angeles for those who don't support the motion. <clears throat> and we'll do this out without penalizing builders or residents or the important effort to meet the affordable housing needs of the Southland. First, the motion does not ban any construction materials, but it does recognize the combustible framing materials burn and so need additional protection. Second, as I speak to you today, the cost of building with concrete and steel, both non-combustible materials, is significantly less expensive than building with combustible framing materials. Last year was 5% less expensive to build a five-story apartment building. Today Thank it's closer you. to 7% less expensive. Thank you very much, sir. Next caller with the number ending in 4513. If your number ends in 4513, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your Hello. name and the items you'd like to speak on. My name is Joshua Christensen, and I'd like to speak on item number one, the fire ordinance. Okay, go ahead. You have one minute. Hi, my name is Josh Christensen. I'm, I'm here today representing the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters, representing 35,000 construction professionals here in Southern California. We urge Public Safety com Committee to move this motion on to the next stage and realizing the increase in fire safety for more Angelinos. As an industry expert in the building construction, 
we support the efforts of Chairperson Rodriguez and Councilman Blumenfield to address that, address what is the increasingly deadly threat posed by wildfires. There are components of fire, spark, oxygen, and fuel. The, re the reduction or elimination of any of these components will eliminate the great, eliminate or greatly reduce the risk of a fire. With the option of fireproof materials ready available, like U.S. steel locally mined or recycled concrete, and even fire retardant lumber, there's no reason for us to continue to use combustible building materials in these tinder box living spaces. Throughout the state, we've already seen and, and will uh, inevitably continue to see large, larger and more frequent tragedies until the change is made. Thank you very much. Next caller with the number ending in 5555. If your number ends in 5555, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, this is item number one. Uh, this is Rabbi Jonathan Klein and is Executive Director of Hope for All. Uh, the building a safer Los Angeles ordinance, which is number one, I believe, on your agenda, is an excellent thing to create a safe, resilient, and affordable housing. My parents had a fire in their wood-framed home when I was younger. They lost their home. Our dog didn't make it, uh, who cowered under the bed. Much of my childhood went up in smoke, and we really should not leave it up to luck, especially those scrapping by with whatever housing they can access to, uh, to get, have safe housing. Just as the FIELD Act ensures that California's public school children are taught in buildings that are safe from earthquakes, this ordinance ensures that Los Angeles families dwell in buildings that are safe from fires, an important assumption of government's role, which reinforces public trust in its leadership. This motion will not increase low-income or single-family housing costs. <clears throat> Sorry, it doesn't even include that latter at all. In fact, non-combustible materials are far lower than currently available traditional construction materials. So Thank please. you very much. Next caller with the number ending in 1556. Ending in 1556, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Kayla, and I'd like to speak on item 1 in general public comment. Okay, you have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Perfect. Good afternoon. My name is Kayla, and I'm calling with the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, FICA. While we appreciate the efforts to address and prevent wildfires in our region, we do have concerns with the impacts that this policy could potentially have on construction in Los Angeles. FICA has been a strong advocate and supporter of solutions that address our city and our state's homelessness and housing crisis, supporting the construction of housing at all economic levels. This policy could counter these efforts and negatively impact housing production by limiting construction types in parts of Los Angeles. We understand the wildfires we have experienced over the last few years have been devastating. However, current wood structural design uses state-of-the-art engineering data, technology, and standards for wood products to ensure that they are safe and have substantially greater fire resistance. Today, buildings are designed to withstand fires, whether they are built with wood or steel, specifically with regards to wood. It is required to be treated with fire retardant chemicals and wrapped into fire-resistant drywalls when wood is used. We urge you not to limit construction type and to consider the cost and impact this motion would have on construction throughout Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 1404. If your number ends in 1404, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Fred Sutton with the California Apartment Association, item 1. Go ahead. One minute. Uh, thank you, uh, council members. We appreciate everything you do and what you go through. Um, we represent housing providers, uh, not developers, but we understand how expensive it is to build in L.A. and how that impacts affordability. We encourage the council or the committee to review housing costs associated with this potential policy change, as well as alternatives to ensure reduced risk. LA has done a tremendous job working to increase affordability, but it is essential we focus on keeping construction costs from rising while also keeping residents safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Next caller with the number ending in 7742. If your number ends in 7742, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yes, my name is Karen. I'd like to address number one and general comments, please. Okay, you've got one minute for one and uh, one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Thank you. I'd just like to offer my support that we do what we can to clear the way for safe building. Um, generally speaking, violent crime is exploding. Why aren't we talking about the rise in crime on this public safety forum? Has Monica Rodriguez and Nuri Martinez reconsidered their stance on defunding the police and the harmful practices of newly elected District Attorney Gascon? Please come forward and condemn his policies. At some point, I'd also like to know or hear Mr. De Leon stand on defunding the police we need Is this to general support public our comment LAPD? or item number one, ma'am? So we're going to take you to general public comment. Go ahead. Keep. Yes, yeah, so I'm on uh, general public. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know Mr. DeLeon's uh, stand on defunding the police. We need to support our LAPD and expect you all to speak up. Our communities are suffering. Crime is on the rise. Violent crime is actually killing us. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate your time. Next caller with the number ending in 4232. If your number ends in 4232, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Chair members. I'm Jacqueline Silver, Public Policy Director for LA Chamber. I'd like to speak on Agenda Item 1. Okay. You've got one minute. Go ahead. The LA Chamber is opposed to Item Number 1 on the agenda, the extension of Fire District 1. While we all support fire safety and prevention, if Fire District 1 were to be extended, it would prohibit wood construction across parts of the city. As a regional chamber that supports those that build homes, our members have made it clear that wood construction is the most cost-effective method to provide residential development. Eliminating wood construction will lead to increased housing costs, delayed building, and reduced housing production during a housing shortage, homelessness crisis, and pandemic. New development is at the forefront of fire safety and providing safe homes is at the core of the home building mission. Based on potential new amendments, we ask that any report done by city departments should review housing costs associated with this policy change. We also ask that the report include alternatives, the expansion of fire district one, and the chamber also encourages a robust stakeholder process so that all industries have the opportunity to share their perspective. Ultimately, the LA Chamber, on behalf of its members, does not want to see the use of wood construction Thank reduced. You. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 0661. If your number ends in 0661, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please Hi, state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Uh, yes, my name is Carol, and I just want to speak on public comment. Okay, you've got one minute. Go ahead. Thank you. I am asking that this committee put a motion before the City Council to denounce George Gascon's radical criminal first policies which are endangering our communities. The recent City Council defunding of police has created situations of skyrocketing crime across our cities, especially in the minority communities. And I don't see the City Council addressing this at all. Now we have a radical DA who is literally laying out the red carpet for criminal activity. Do the law-abiding citizens of this city have your attention at all? Many city council members are up for re-election. Some are even running for mayor. They need to stop pandering to BLM and other criminal organizations and start supporting our LAPD and our communities, or you may find yourself jobless in the, after the next election. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 4222. If your number ends in 4222, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Miller with the L.A. Orange County Building Trades. I'd like to speak on item number one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, one I'm, here on, I'm here on behalf of over 140,000 skilled and trained men and women that work every day in L.A. and Orange County. And... We cannot forget about all the fires that regularly occur here in Southern California. It is very important to make this happen for the safety of our firemen, for the safety of our construction workers, and the general public that live in these dwellings. Every Angelino deserves to live in a nice, safe place. Avoid a fire. 
So let's not forget the fires we've had in the past and let's move this uh, initiative along so that we can get to building nice and good, safe dwellings. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next caller with the number ending in 4407. If your number ends in 4407, press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Samantha, item two, item three, and general comment, please. Okay, you've got uh, two minutes for those items and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Um, item two, I think it's good to honor the life and wrongfully shortened career of Robert William Stewart since it highlights the importance of due process. Please give every officer due process and don't criminalize them before there's evidence and an indep independent board. Item three, uh, regarding the mental health unit, uh, be very careful since uh, these social workers will be unarmed and they could be put in harm's way. And if they need backup, it will put more of a strain on our already stretched thin budget um, if both are called to um, a uh, call. And then general comment, as a citizen of Los Angeles, I'm extremely concerned about the rise in crime. According to the LAPD chief's crime stat, shooting victims are up 153% year to date and homicides have increased 39%, which includes our youth. I was, I was shocked and still am shocked to hear that you, the city council, voted in favor of defunding our police. You city officials are partially responsible for this increase in crime and blood is on your hands. Monica Rodriguez, you are my representative. However, you do little to represent me or my neighbors when it comes to public safety. Ask anyone who lives in the foothills and they will all tell you we need more police. We have reckless drivers who have no regard for life. They will k kill people and have killed people already. And we need more traffic enforcement. I can only imagine how dangerous it is in the south part of Los Angeles with all these shootings, homicides, gang violence, and sex trafficking. Thank you, Councilmember Joe Buscaino, for being one of the few voices standing up against this violence, supporting our police, and advocating for victims and their families. I implore the committee to put a motion forward to condemn the dangerous policies of District Attorney George Jeffstone and vote on it. Uh, we are against the $0 bail, and there's less consequences for criminals, which puts our streets in danger. Defend, not defund LAPD. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 7006. If your number ends in 7006, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Next caller with the number ending in 1474. If your number ends in 1474, press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Michael Shilson with Central City Association. I'd like to speak on item one, please. Okay, you've got one minute. Go ahead. This motion has the potential to greatly impact wood construction, which is our most affordable and sustainable building material available. The majority of new multifamily housing in our region, including nearly all 100% affordable housing developments, and those funded by Proposition HHH, rely on timber. These developments are already very expensive to build, and limiting wood construction could increase barriers to affordable housing. Given the potential impacts of this motion, we would request that LADBS, LAFD, and City Planning provide a report before Council decides whether to move forward with such an ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 2042. If your number ends in 2042, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, this is Phil Tabby. I'd like to speak on items number 214 and general comment, please. Okay, you've got two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I'd like to first go to item number two. I do agree with change in the roll call room name that that's very good i'm going to skip real quick to item number 14 uh john's towing the only thing i want to say about that is 
he's a great person in the community, and it's great that you know the city is going to adopt him to be our OPG. The only thing is, um, I'm hoping there's no red tape. You know, maybe uh, people taking too long to get to him to make sure everything permitted wise is done correctly. Um, so hopefully, any red tape can be cut. Um, you know, things can be done in a timely manner. I'd also like to say that I looked at the rest of the agenda and I really wasn't sold that this is a public safety committee. You know, nothing really on the agenda is <clears throat> helping eliminate the rise in crime. Other callers stated the rise in crime. You know, we're 107.4% rise in homicides since 2019. You know, victims to date, this now shot is up 143%. You know, and I, I don't even want to go into the gang crime happening over in 77. But, you know, this crime is not beholden to one location, South L.A. This is all over. Look what happened in Melrose. Horrible incident. It's like the 90s all over again. It's not fair to our Angelinos, and it's really not fair to our most vulnerable communities. Um, you know, we've heard about George Gaston. He's a DA that many of us don't like, and his policies are really bad. And I really would like this uh, city council to issue a vote of no confidence against uh, George Gascon. I'd like you guys to put a motion forward to do that. But, um, you know, general comment is uh, we need to take and put safety and the people first and, you know, not pandering to certain uh, entities such as DLM. You know, they got $90, 000, $90 million in their bank account. But what community communities have they helped none we need to worry about angelinos you know you can't walk down the middle anymore you have to pick a side you know are you for safety in our communities or are you for you know the radicalization of, of changing our police policies and everything like that so i mean what's the plan uh, public safety committee we would like to know what the plan is um and we would like to know soon because the rise in crime is even felt in the valley. And everybody that I speak to, and I speak to a lot of people, are not happy with the rise in crime. So I can see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 6256. If your number ends in 6256, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mayan Nimbo. I'd like to speak on uh, items three, four, five, and also give general public comment. Okay, you've got two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm calling today because I'm a bit concerned about the priorities of the Public Safety Committee. Um, in June, there were huge protests from Angelinos uh, going out to the streets. Uh, demanding change and real change, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and I'm kind of disappointed to see that the, the things that have actually moved along since June, eight months later, um, have been really lackluster. Um, for example, item number three, that's uh, kind of allocating more money towards uh, police units that provide mental health services, but their social workers who choose that as a lifelong profession um, and who can provide those types of services much more effectively than officers who have taken 40 hours of training um, through the county's Department of Health. So I just think that this committee really needs to focus in on what's actually going to be transformative for the way that we provide public safety in the city. Um, on that note, I'd also, I'd, I really, really like um, Items four and five, personally, I, I love item five. I think that there's a lot of really great potential there. Um, and I just want to encourage the, the, this committee to move that uh, forward and maybe even try to um, hasten up that timeline a little bit. There's other cities like Denver that have already cr in, implemented similar programs. They have results. The city of LA can look to that. And I think on a... Um, I've heard a lot, I've been listening to the rest of the public comment, and a lot of people are talking about concern around defunding the police, but I'd, I'd like to point out that this uh, year, LA City faced a massive budget crisis, and departments across the city had to cut budgets. LAPD is the only, but only department that didn't cut a budget. 
Um, as a recent graduate, I am deeply concerned by this because I'm looking for a job. And right now, the city is having a hiring freeze. Um, you know, all these other agencies are really in the pits, and yet LAPD is trying to shake down the city in order to hire more officers and to increase their budget. So I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there about that. I just wanted to clarify it. And um, Mitchell Farrell, you are my, my city councilor. I really hope that you you take my my public comment to heart um, in, in kind of the rest of this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back to the caller with the number ending in 7006. If your number ends in 7006, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please take your yeah. number and press the speak on. All items in the general comment period. If I may. Mr. Spin. Yes? Mr. Spindler, you've already had your public comment. Thank you. No! Madam Chair, you're on mute. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the number ending in 1502. If you end in 1502, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Next caller with the number ending in 9424. If your number ends in 9424, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller, please state good your afternoon. name if you'd like to speak on. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Gerard Wright. I'm speaking on item number one okay. on behalf of the Greater LA Realtors. I'm calling uh, at least with some questions related to this particular ordinance uh, as it as we're, as it sp or pertains to intersecting with the Green New Deal, which is looking to increase housing production, and also with uh, the state's push around building more housing around these accessory dwelling units and compact lot subdivision ordinance that the city has. Those two seem to are creating the most housing across the city, and it's an opportunity that I think could be uh, well utilized. I just want to know, uh, let's get some clarity as this ordinance, does that in, in, in interfere with the housing production using uh, ADUs and other compact uh, developments that are being produced to produce more housing in the city? Just a clarification and a question. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and have a great day. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 7987. If your number ends in 7987, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Next caller with the number ending in 2240. If your number ends in 2240, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, uh, this is Sabrina Johnson. I'd like to give a general public comment, please. Okay, you've got one minute. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so I was just listening in and um, to some of the callers who want to uh, actually put more money back into the police, um, in particular the caller who was concerned about vehicle accidents and reckless driving, I actually have a suggestion that does not involve putting more money into the police, and that is... We should be making these fines proportional to income because rich people with fast cars who like to drive their cars fast don't give a fuck about a $200 ticket or whatever it is. Um, you could easily make those fines proportional to income and have a deterrent that would actually generate revenue for the city instead of putting more money into cops there. Um, so just my two cents on an issue that was raised 
in public comment, but uh, these people are fucking clowns who want to give more money to the cops. Come on. Okay, thank you. Caller with the private number, please press star six to unmute yourself. Caller with the private number, press star six, please. Hi, caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Next caller with the number ending in 2992. If you your number ends in 2992, press star six to unmute yourself. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Uh, Heather, uh, General Connor, please. Okay, you've got one minute. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to say that uh, I'd like to see this public safety committee uh, give a, a vote of no confidence to George Gascon. Um, and consider that since that is your uh, duty, public safety. Um, and I have news for you guys, Monica and pretty much everyone except for Joe. If you guys try to walk down the middle of the road in your re-election, you will lose to BLM progressive-backed candidates. There's no playing both sides here, guys. You're going to have to come out to the right, really to the center, and start appealing to the moderates and the pro-public safety, pro-police um, uh, constituents that you have. Otherwise, you will lose the vote. You will lose the election. Um, and... We need more police, definitely, not less. The people in minority communities are the ones suffering right now. People are being shot. Um, sh shots are way up. And this is a public safety Thank committee. So There's much. nothing on this agenda. Next caller with the number ending in 1502. If your number ends in 1502, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Um, my name is Lorena Sanguino. I'd like to uh, just general public comment. Okay, you've got one minute. Go ahead. Okay. I am calling, uh, concerned about the rising crime in the city and your lack of response to it. But meanwhile, you let your business cronies have the majority of the platform. I reviewed today's agenda. There's nothing listed that will address a 40% increase in homicides, 90% increase in shots fired, and 143% increase in victim shots. This is not only your main job as city council members, but your job as members of the public safety committee that you choose chose to be a part of. You're solely responsible for not taking swift action and addressing the increase in crime. You approved $32 million to be redirected from LAPD to homeless issues? Are you kidding? You, rather, you created the homeless issue, and now you're creating a public safety issue. Just because you don't feel the effects of your motions doesn't mean that the rest of us who live and work in the city do. I participated in a town hall last week for 77th Division, where there are almost 200 participants in a town hall, majority who are black and brown. They complained about the increases of crime like all of us, but they also complained about quality of life issues such as street races, neighborhood disputes, and stalking. All the senior officers. Thank you. Next caller with the number ending in 7006. If your number ends in 7006, press star 6 to unmute yourself, please. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Next caller with the private number, press star six to unmute yourself. If you called it on a private number, press star six. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Last caller with the number ending in 4407. 4407, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Okay. That concludes general public comment, colleagues. And, uh, and for the record, I just wanted to communicate for those that were uh, under... Uh, that are misinformed on the role of public safety committee. Uh, the item that is uh, before us today does involve a substantial uh, fire life safety issue, which is why it's on the public safety committee agenda for those that are uninformed about the responsibility that we have to assure public safety, not just with respect to 
Los Angeles police activities, uh, but also with respect to fire life safety issues. So I just wanted to confirm that item uh, as it is a very substantive issue that does have implications across the city. Um, moreover, uh, happy to uh, uh, request colleagues that uh, next I would like to take up items to be approved on consent that we approve on the recommendations for items 3, 5 through 10, 14, 15. And seeing no objections, Madam Clerk, if you'll please call the roll. For the record, uh, Madam Chair, for item five, will we be approving the receive and file and then the CAO recommendations for items six through 10 and also 15? Yes, please. Okay, calling the roll to take all of the items three, five through 10, 14 and 15 on consent. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member O'Farrell? Aye. Council Member Buscaino? Aye. Council Member De Leon? Bye. And Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Five ayes. These items are approved. Thank you so much. And now that takes us to item number two, please. Item number two is a motion by De Leon, Ridley Thomas, and Price relative to the renaming of the Los Angeles Police Department's Central Area Roll Call Room as the Robert William Stewart roll call room in honor of the first African-American to serve in the LAPD. Thank you so much, colleagues. And uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge Chief Moore, who has joined us. Thank you. It's good to see you, sir. Glad you're uh, feeling better. And, be um, and uh, you know, colleagues, uh, today today's item uh, really brings an important step in the right direction in reconciling uh, and mending decades of racial injustice. And uh, Chief, I uh, now turn it over to you to uh, take us through this item. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the other committee members. Thank you for uh, uh, giving us a few moments to uh, talk briefly about this matter and to seek your uh, support. I also want to thank Councilmember De Leon, as well as Councilmember Mark Ridley Thomas, and Councilmember Karen Price, who made this motion uh, to uh, honor and a man who came to this organization over 100 years ago and faced injustices and ultimately lived his life in Los Angeles without uh, this the city and this department uh, reconciling an error and a mistake and, a, and, a, and a, a wrong that was imposed upon him. For members of the general public, uh, the matter I'm speaking about is Robert Stewart. Robert Stewart, Robert William Stewart was born in Kentucky in, in 1850 and moved with his family to Los Angeles in 1889, where he alongside Joseph Henry Green became the first African-American uh, police officers in, the department, in this very young department. Officer Stewart was assigned to work patrol in what is now the central area. He worked a footy along the Broadway corridor. Uh, he was recognized not only uh, in the prominence of him being the first African-American patrolman in Los Angeles, but more importantly, his exemplary work uh, for the residents of Los Angeles as they moved about this, uh, this budding and growing city. Over an, a decade later, in May of 1900, Mr. Stewart, Officer Stewart was arrested by LAPD detectives for assaulting, allegedly assaulting a 15-year-old girl. And Mr. Uh, Officer Stewart was fired uh, by the Board of Police Commissioners prior to any due process. Uh, it took uh, the Board of Police Commissioners two different uh, instances of, of voting to remove him. And on a split vote, they, on a three to two vote, he was removed as, as a police officer. He was ultimately uh, faced trial, a first jury resulting in a hung jury, the second jury finding him not guilty in less than an hour. However, despite him being found not guilty of the charges, uh, he was never reinstated or rehired by the department. Uh, and he later worked throughout the rest of his remaining life in Los Angeles, uh, leading a responsible and, and dignified life. And however, he died at the age of 81 uh, in July of 1931, uh, never having restored uh, his name and his position within this organization. And this, this matter has been uh, in and out of the uh, department's uh, annuals as far as an awareness and, and recognition has been lacking. And during the 150th anniversary of this organization, uh, while we reflected upon great moments of success, we also recognized that there were tremendous uh, dark chapters, instances of injustices, not only to uh, communities across Los Angeles of all makes and walks, but also to members of this organization. 
proud today to have representatives from two of our employee organizations, the Oscar Joel Bryant Society, that's Sergeant uh, Jody Steiger from the Inspector General's Office, as well as Commander Alan Hamilton from the American Law Enforcement, uh, American Black Law Enforcement Executive Organization, as well as others such as I see uh, Captain Aaron McCraney of our Recruitment and Employment Division. These members of the organization stand as on the shoulders, as we all do, upon what Officer Stewart stood for as members of this of the police officer serving the people of Los Angeles. But we also must come to terms with the fact that as an organization and as a city, we failed him, as we failed other police officers, as we've made reforms and, and made efforts to evolve and ensure that the way we treat people inside this organization is as fair and dignified and respectful as, as every Angelino expects to be treated by members of this organization. So this effort today is to embark upon a, a, a reconciliation by establishing a roll call room, the central roll call room, a place where every member of Uniform Patrol working in the downtown corridor comes to work each day. And they receive their instructions, guidance, and, and direction. And to recognize Officer Stewart uh, by placing uh, and renaming that, uh, hit that room as the Officer Stewart roll call room is to remember our history, to acknowledge his, uh, not just what he gave to us, but the wrongs and injustices that he faced at the hands of this organization and an organization that's willing and able to acknowledge those mistakes and move forward. Uh, and move forward in a manner that promises and commits to both the people of Los Angeles as well as the people within our organization that we will right the wrongs and we'll, and we'll set a course forward that is fair and treats people with dignity and respect that every individual deserves. So I ask for your support of this uh, as the uh, Board of Police Commissioners endorsed, as well as in their efforts uh, to address this matter. They re uh, ceremoniously reinstated Officer Stewart to a position of police officer and honorably retired him. It is a regret that there is no surviving uh, members of the Officer Stewart family uh, in which to bring and recognize their contribution. But I do believe that every member of this organization, particularly our African-American members, both sworn and civilian, uh, deserve this as an acknowledgement by the department that we have not uh, always and many times frequently discriminated, discriminated against and mistreated people on the basis of their race, their gender, their sexual, sexual orientation, and other uh, types of, of, of diversity that we should value and, and embrace rather than reject and establish barriers against. So thank you again for this moment. I do have these members here. They're willing and able to speak with you, but I also recognize you have a full agenda. With that, I submit my remarks. Madam you're Chair, muted. you're muted. You're muted. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Chief. Thank you, Commander Hamilton, um, Mr. Steiger, Mr. McCraney. I appreciate you all being here uh, in solidarity with this moment. And uh, may it be one that reminds us all of the responsibilities that we have to ensure a fair and just process uh, for the members of the department uh, and as, you know, as it should be with members of the public. So we thank you very much for being here. Uh, Mr. DeLeon, did you have a comment? Yeah, just very quickly, uh, thank you much, um, Madam uh, uh, Chair. I'd like to take a moment and recognize the significance and the, the importance of acknowledging the life and, uh, and the life experience of, of Officer you know, Robert Stewart. You know, a lot of kudos to, to Chief Moore for bringing this to the forefront. As, as we know, Officer Stewart's dismissal from the LAPD over a century ago was very emblematic, clearly, of, of the times. And despite leading a, an incredibly upright life demonstrating a willingness to serve the public good and believing in the unspoken American creed of, above all, professes to honor liberty and equality for all people. At the end of the day, he was not seen as an equal because of the color of his skin. So, you know, his standing as the first black, you know, LAPD officer obviously threatened the widely accepted social and racial inequalities uh, of the time. So. Um, in, in terms of recognizing him, in terms of, you know, naming a, a, a roll call, you know, um, uh, room uh, for him uh, in Central, uh, uh, in uh, downtown Los Angeles, um, is uh, a, a huge recognition of a man who was, uh, who was wronged uh, by the institution that he served, uh, by the city that he served, 
and although he did finish his life, as we know, as an LAPD officer, uh, he still was a man who kept his head up high with dignity, and this is the very least that we owe him. Uh, obviously, collectively, we find the treatment of Officer Stewart tragic and shameful in light of our city's history that cannot be so easily recognized, or I should say erased by this recognition um, at this public hearing, you know, in city council as a whole. So, you know, uh, uh, it is what a huge step forward at the very minimum to honor, you know, uh, Robert Stewart. Again, I want to give the recognition to the LMPD officers, but in particular, you know, to Chief Moore who brought this forward. Uh, and uh, I thank you very much. I thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, and so with that, thank you, Chief, again. Oh, Mr. Harris Dawson? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, applaud Chief Moore and the uh, men of law enforcement that joined us today for this important memorial. These memorials are, are super important, and, and room namings are super important because they remind us, uh, these kinds of story remind us how um, sideways or how wrong things can go when we don't pay attention uh, to things like tolerance, inclusion, and, and racial justice. I, I also appreciate the chief uh, for bringing this forward because I will tell you, as a student of Los Angeles history, part of what happens in the African-American community when the larger community shames someone like this man, they get raised. I grew up learning. I learned about uh, Oscar Joel Bryant. I learned about Homer uh, uh, Broom. I learned about Rocky Washington. Um, I learned about so many historic figures in LAPD. I didn't learn about this person. And uh, I was uh, gratified to learn and, and gratified at the actions that the, the, the police department was taking uh, to recognize this person, but also the story, because there are two sides. There's what this person did, but there's also how the city as a whole, all of us, and uh, the department behaved in relation to him. So, uh, uh, again, kudos to the chief. Uh, and all the men of law enforcement that uh, have been a part of this designation. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris Dawson. And so with that, colleagues, I'd like to recommend the adoption of the motion. And uh, Madam Clerk, if you please call the roll. Calling the roll to adopt item number two, Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Alfaro. Aye. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. Council Member DeLeon? Aye. And Council Member Harris Dawson? Yes. Five ayes. This item is adopted. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. We appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Colleagues, that now brings us to item number one on today's agenda. Item number one is a motion by Blumenfield, Rodriguez, and Harris Dawson relative to the expansion of Fire District 1, a tool that exists to address increased fire risk in our dense urban communities and is already in place in the city's building code. This item was approved as amended on December 3rd, 2019 by the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Thank you so much, colleagues. The motion before us calls for the expansion of Fire District 1 in order to better protect the growing multifamily housing stock in dense neighborhoods and achieve enhanced fire life safety. The Plum, the Plum Committee that Mr. Harris Dawson chairs uh, heard this item over a year ago, and I understand that the departments had convened to conduct a preliminary review of uh, the proposed expansion. Uh, we'll start off with a few questions, and uh, we have here with us today uh, Chief Crowley and uh, from our uh, Los Angeles City Fire Department, as well as Charmy Hewn. Charmy, there you are. Okay, Hi. terrific. Hi there. And um, first of all, ladies, I just I want to first thank you uh, for helping us get to this moment where we are today for all of your work. For And I, I would be remiss if I also didn't acknowledge the incredible work of my team. Uh, I want to thank Felicia or Orozco, uh, but uh, I'm looking at all these ladies that have helped to bring us to this point, and I just got to say, yes, of course, here we are. Um, so uh, I want to thank you all, and uh, it, uh, just to begin on this uh, item, I want you to please give an overview uh, and an explanation of Fire District 1 to the committee. Where is Fire District 1, uh, current, where it's currently applicable, and what are the characteristics and provisions? Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, council members. 
I'm Carmi Huen with the Department of Building and Safety. So Fire District 1 is a very old uh, building code provision that we can cite news articles all the way um, dating back to the 1890s where they referenced the fire districts in the city. This was at a time when LA had its own building code and the codes were not uniform throughout the state or the nation and they were not as stringent as they are today in terms of fire life safety. Uh, the fire districts were meant to fill in the gaps of these fire life safety requirements and um, also to address the fire risks in certain areas of the city. So today's Fire District 1, what it does is it limits the types of construction allowed within the district. And type of construction is a term that's defined in the state building code. Um, it's meant to dictate the types of materials that are allowed to um, be used in the building for, for construction, and it's meant to um, prescribe certain fire life safety uh, requirements for the buildings in each classification. So going back to what Fire District 1 requires, it, it only allows types 1, 2, and 3 construction. It prohibits types 4 and 5. Types 1 and 2 generally, um, it, it only allows non-combustible construction, so that's generally steel and concrete. Uh, your typical high-rise building that you see here in downtown is Type 1 construction, for reference. Um, type 3 construction is a combination of construction materials, and that is a combination of steel and concrete. It could have wood in the interior of the building. And for reference, that type of building could be an eight-story apartment building, where you have five levels of apartment over um, two, actually, um, yeah, five levels over two levels, so a seven-story apartment building. Um, uh, quickly on types 4 and 5, type 4 is another, um, which is prohibited in Fire District 1. It's a combination type where it allows um, heavy timber with non-combustible construction. And type 5 is your um, general type of construction that allows all wood, and that's reserved for single-family dwellings, uh, story apartments. Um, it has limits to the allowable height. Um, Fire District 1 is currently applicable uh, throughout various regions of the city, such as regional centers in downtown and Hollywood, uh, Wilshire Boulevard centers in Koreatown and Miracle Mile, Westwood and the Van Nuys Civic Center, major boulevards such as Wilshire, Santa Monica, and Hollywood Boulevard that are beyond the regional centers. It also includes malls like Century City, The Grove, and Baldwin Hills Crenshaw. It also includes San Pedro Downtown District and Venice's Oceanfront Walk, which is adjacent to the skate park. I can note that the fire district is primarily composed of commercial and manufacturing uses with very limited amounts of residential uses currently. Thank you. Are there certain requirements needed to expand Fire District 1? Yes. Um, so the way to expand Fire District 1 is dictated by state law because Fire District 1 is a local code amendment to the state building code. In the 1980s, the jurisdictions throughout the state were required to adopt the California Building Code. In that way, it became a uniform way of applying all of these building construction standards to the build, to building construction. The state law also mandates that local jurisdictions can amend uh, the state building code, um, provided the amendment is more restrictive and that it meets um, certain findings that are based on either topographic, geologic, or climatic reasons. So since Fire District 1 is a local amendment to the State Building Code, any changes to it would have to meet this process. And we would have to make those findings um, to expand Fire District 1 and make sure that, you know, we make the proper findings based on those factors of topographic, geologic, or climatic, and that are characteristic to the city. Thank you. Uh, the motion calls for Fire District 1 provisions to be expanded to very high fire hazard severity zones, high wind velocity zones, and areas with a certain population density. Can you please speak on the feasibility of this proposed expansion and provide feedback uh, from, your, from your review? Yeah, so the department uh, got together. We took an initial look into the scope of the motion language and realized it did cover a very broad area of the city. Um, including areas zoned for single-family dwellings. Um, the motion, like you mentioned, Council Member, that it includes the very high fire hazard severity zone, uh, which covers a good-sized portion of the northern part of our city. 
I would like to note that there are already very robust fire protection measures in the building codes for these very high fire hazard severity zones. Um, the state code requirements dictate the materials and construction methods allowed in these fire zones, and the intent is to add additional fire protection requirements to building construction and to curb the proliferation of fire through the spread of embers in the event of high winds. So in our initial review of the motion language um, to expand Fire District 1, we are not confident that we will be able to make the necessary findings per state law. And this is because the area described in the motion is broad. It covers various uh, differing topographies and geologic characteristics, such as the flat versus hillside regions and the dense um, versus sprawling land areas. It would be difficult to make the findings to expand Fire District 1 in such a broad manner. And, but we'd be happy to look further into it if directed to do so. I'd like to invite uh, Chief Crowley to perhaps comment further on additional fire life safety provisions that exist in our local fire code. Okay, so good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, I'm happy to be here. So uh, thank you, Sharmi, for that. Um, you know, from our perspective, uh, I'd just like to uh, piggyback off of what Sharmi had said, just specifically uh, with the requirements within the very high fire hazard severity zone. Uh, Charmy already spoke on uh, specifically what uh, requirements they have within their building code, which is uh, Chapter 7A. So they're they're real stringent and strict already. Um, now you piggyback that uh, with our own local ordinance with our brush clearance. So our brush clearance in itself, uh, that had been around since 1997. And as we know, the importance of that. If you look even deeper into the brush clearance ordinance, uh, we require an additional, uh, a total of 200 feet, which is even more restrictive than a lot of the other local counties and states. So when you combine both the uh, building code requirements as well as our local ordinance with the brush clearance, uh, we're, we're fairly confident that just in that specific area within the very high fire hazard severity zones that those codes, when they work together, make that area uh, very safe. Thank you. And um, Charmy, I just had a, another quick question. I, I've got one more question after that, and then I'll uh, avail opportunity for my colleagues. Um, but should adoption of, uh, of this policy go into effect, at what time would it then affect projects that are either in development or uh, permitted, unpermitted? What, at what point would we kind of set the clock on the timeline? So. Usually with ordinances, they're not retroactive. Um, it would be based on uh, when the ordinance uh, becomes effective and any uh, project submittals after that date, um, the ordinance would apply to, to those projects, not anything that's already permitted or in plan check. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, and, you know, the goal here is to utilize the Fire District 1 building code to achieve greater fire life safety. Are there, uh, what other alternatives or options might we consider to appropriately expand Fire District 1? Yes, yeah, so with the direction from the council offices um, to take a look at the motion scope, uh, we got together the departments to explore the characteristics of the existing Fire District 1 area. And what we found were um, some characteristics that were similar with each other, such as uh, the shared zoning designations that allow for high densities, including multifamily and commercial land uses, and uh, zoning des designations that allow for tall buildings and zero yard setbacks and projections. And so with this initial review, it would be worth looking into expanding Fire District 1 into other areas in the city that share the similar characteristics. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I, uh, Mr. O'Farrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief Crowley, and thank you, Charmy. Good to see you. A uh, couple of quick questions. Uh, the first question I have, it's really more or less two-part. Uh, of course, we want to increase fire life safety and uh, save structures, prevent them from being at risk to fire, and, of course, reduce injury and fatality uh, with enhanced building codes. Um, do you have a sense of uh, how this this will make the buildings safer, but more importantly, does the fire department have any data on loss of life and or property or similarly uh, uh, 
from similarly sized buildings in the past couple of years. Any data? So, for example, um, buildings that don't have the advantage of this, you know, upgraded code. Do we have recent fires as an example um, that you could cite that may have been protected had these protections been in place? Right. So a great question. Uh, as for having data in front of me as we speak, I'll say, no, I don't have that. But that's why we'd be happy to come back and report on your specific question. We can dig into the data and find out and compare uh, the structures that have the requirements for Fire District 1 uh, and then compare that, obviously, to the ones that don't. So we'd be happy Thank to you. come back and report on that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Madam, Madam Chair, I think that would be very helpful. Um, Yes, and then other question is, what other municipalities have, that, to your knowledge, have adopted similar uh, requirements with this building type? Any examples? You know, I, I don't know of any examples. Uh, I'd be happy to, you know, look into that further and report back, but not off the top of my head. Okay, uh, that, that could be helpful as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. De Leon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm a huge supporter of making construction in Los Angeles uh, much safer. And my district uh, clearly has seen building fires such as the famous Da Vinci fire that caused major damage uh, to the city facilities at Figueroa Plaza. Uh, adjacent to the 110 freeway, and we need to ensure we are building safety. Uh, the current fire district one includes a majority of downtown in, in my district, uh, CD14. As a point of clarification, what specifically will be added to fire district one as part of this proposed action? And what are the differences in construction methods and or materials in fire district one for a, a typical multi-story wood frame project, say, versus the rest of the city? So I can answer your first part of your question, Council Member. Um, this proposed motion is not proposing to add any additional requirements, like technical fire life safety requirements to Fire District 1. It's only proposing to expand um, the boundaries of it. So currently in the Fire District 1 ordinance, it lists the various areas that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, like the, the Grove and, and the regional centers. So this motion is proposing to, um, I guess, add areas, add, bound, add additional areas into the ordinance. But in terms of um, uh, fire life safety requirements, it's not proposing to add anything. It's expansion of the district. So, so if I hear you correctly, it's not expanding the district or... Well, it's expanding the scope of the district. It's adding, air, it's proposing to add areas within the city into the district. Yes, precisely. And, and who, who, who will be making those decisions with regards to the lines specifically? That becomes a policy. This That's is the conversation. Yeah. So, Madam Chair, obviously, to the Madam Chair, that, that we would be deciding. As, as policymakers, those, this, policy, uh, this policy would basically uh, affect what the light, what the area is defined by, what what defines these areas as uh, fire district one. Okay, I mean, that obviously won't be done today. No. Okay. Okay. Very good. And then the the, the the last question I have is is um, and maybe it's a further discussion, you know, offline, you know, with staff, with what the, the makers of the motion um, is the question of, of affordability. Uh, and what we're doing with regards to low to, to moderate uh, income uh, housing. Does that have any impacts on, on, on low to moderate income housing? So I, we, I don't have any information on affordability, but we'd be happy to look into it um, if, if directed and, and report back. Mm -hmm. Please, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to uh, hear from that, you know, obviously as, as we move on forward. With that, thank you much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. De Leon. Um, good question. I have the same question. I'd love to hear more because, as you know, you and I, we, in, in, we talk in H&P and, uh, on the importance of cost per unit in our, in our city <clears throat> and how will this have an impact on 
the future costs of housing uh, in, in our city. Um, so I, I, I support that uh, report back. But um, my question is, um, you know, if the intention of this motion before us is to address the increased risk of wildfires, then why is population density being proposed as a metric for applying these more stringent construction standards? Why not just the very high fire severity zones that we've seen, um, homes that are crumbled in, uh, in, in these high fire zones? Well, Mr. Buscaino, I, I, just to uh, address that concern directly, I agree with you, and that's we're going to be making an amendment to reflect that. Wonderful. How about the percentage? What percentage of the land area of the city would be included uh, in Fire District 1 if we move forward? We know that, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, um, at the moment, we don't have that data. Um, so It'll be, that, that information, Mr. Buscaino, because we're, we're going to have a number of amendments here to consider, and it would further provide an opportunity to give those determining factors so that before, there's, okay. we're not going to adopt anything today. Sure. Um, so. I'm, I'm assuming it would also include uh, reports on the effect of construction costs. Have there been any outside studies that can help us understand what the, uh, the different material costs may mean for development in LA? Yeah, we'd like to get that information as well. Got you. Uh, percentage of the city's existing housing stock is wood framed. What percentage of that is? Uh, will this proposal do anything? To improve the safety for those residents, are building safe today? Is shifting this to steel concrete proven to be most effective way to prevent building fires? I'd like to hear that as well. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, members, I, I think if I can, to, just to land this for, for me, um, you know, looking back in 2019, the fire department responded to a record low of eight civilian deaths attributed to structure fires. In that same year, we saw a record high number of homeless die in our sidewalks, over 1,200 across the county. Last year, as reported before this committee, the fire department reported that of the 11,417 fires in the city, 54% were homeless related and nearly 70% were homeless arson fires. Over 70% of fires last year were homeless related. And I've heard from several property owners that they're unable to obtain fire insurance because of the risk posed by sprawling encampments on our sidewalks. And from my perspective, um, the greatest risk is this city is, is not from wildfires, it's from homelessness. Um, and the more requirements we put on the construction of new housing, the more difficult we make it to solve homelessness. Uh, something that, colleagues, you, we all have sh shared that same concern. Um, so I'm concerned it's hypocritical for us to add more requirements for construction on private property when we can continue to turn a blind eye to the fire danger posed by sprawling, dangerous homeless encampments located on public property. So looking forward to more information as we move forward. Madam Chair, thank you for um, agreeing to, to these report backs um, and uh, appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Buscaino. And, and yes, and, and while I totally recognize all of uh, the points that you made, and they're all valid points, um, we have to also uh, take into consideration and for a district like mine where uh, over half of my district had been, has been evacuated as a result of wildfires, where we've seen uh, the devastation as a result of the Woolsey fire uh, yep. and substantial uh, devastation, we do have to have a, a, you know, we have to go in with eyes wide open and having the, and having these conversations and seeing how we balance all of those items uh, to assure fire life safety, but as well as to balance it out with uh, cost assessments uh, and the like. And so um, that's what this conversation is about. And so thank you for frankly helping to tee up uh, some of the recommendations that I have. And I, Take I don't the know will, you... Madam Chair. Take the will. <laughs> I never let go. <laughs> so uh, with that, colleagues, again, uh, Chief Crowley, Charmy, um, thank you so very much for 
all the time and energy that you've uh, helped to, to help get us here because, again, uh, to the comments that uh, my colleagues have made on this, it is uh, not something that we should endeavor to do swiftly uh, without considerations, and uh, we have to be very thoughtful about every decision that we make and the implications of such decisions, particularly with respect uh, to housing construction as it applies here in the city of Los Angeles, particularly at a time when we consider the, the incredible uh, needs that we have for the construction of housing. And so that said, colleagues, I'd like to direct the Department of Building and Safety, Fire Department, uh, and Department of City Planning with the assistance of the city attorney to report back in 30 days on the following. Number one, feasibility of an ordinance to expand Fire District 1 to areas within the city that are, not, that are similar to existing conditions, including but not limited to high density multifamily and commercial land use and zoning designations that allow for tall buildings to achieve greater fire life safety. Two, current fire life safety codes applicable to structures within the very high fire hazard severity zones and high wind velocity zones and the feasibility of amending the current code requirements with additional fire life safety measures. Uh, I would like to, uh, I would like the appropriate departments to develop a fire protection plan as allowed under chapter 33 of the Los Angeles fire code for all new and significantly altered projects over 150,000 square feet and or 100,000 square feet if the building is over 30 feet in height and make recommendations to ensure proper enforcement and uh, provide recommendations on how to ensure that top quality skilled and responsible construction practices are utilized and guaranteed for new multifamily and commercial structures within the high risk areas encompassed in fire district one. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the report backs are also to include the impacts of affordable housing and construction costs, as well as a study of material costs. Did I, did I get all your uh, amendments, everybody? Uh, Mr. O'Farrell? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, uh, uh, the, and the Chief addressed this in our dialogue, and that is, could, could we do a report back on loss of life and or property on similarly sized buildings in recent years? And uh, then a, an, some sort of uh, evaluation or, or knowledge gathering on uh, other cities within Los Angeles County that have adopted similar requirements, if, if any exist at all. Thank you, Chief Crowley. You got that? Okay. <laughs> all Thank right, you. Madam. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, on the piece on housing affordability, can we add that as well? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Bruce Gaido. Okay. Yeah, we mentioned it. Um, oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you all so much. I think we got it all. It was a mouthful, so thank you. And I move that we adopt the motion as amendment as amended. Excuse me, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Just a couple of questions for clarification, Madam Chair. Was that mm -hmm. a total of five verbal amendments from you? Uh, yes. Okay, and then uh, one additional from Councilmember O'Farrell and Councilmember Buscainos was included in yours? Yes. Okay, and these amendments are to replace uh, what was submitted by the Plum Committee or in addition to? Replace. Okay, call in the roll to approve the motion as amended with six verbal amendments read into the record. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember O'Farrell? Aye. Councilmember Buscaino? Aye. Councilmember De Leon? Aye. And Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yeah. Six eyes, sorry, five eyes. This item is approved as amended. Thank you very much. Uh, now that brings us to item number four on today's agenda, please. Item number four is a Board of Police Commissioners report relative to a Los Angeles Police Department report back on the various components within LAPD whose response to calls for service typically include a co-response by another outside entity. Terrific. Thank you, colleagues. And I know we've been joined, I think Commander Hamilton is with us and Lieutenant Muniz 
I see you there. I don't see Commander Hamilton, uh, but I'm sure he's on with us somewhere. Oh, Hamilton. Okay. Okay. So um, thank you all very much, colleagues. Uh, this item is related to... Uh, oh, wait, someone's trying to get in. Hold on one sec. Uh, as you know, uh, our Los Angeles Police Department for some time has been working to uh, introduce a number of uh, innovative co-responder models, uh, such as the system-wide mental assessment uh, response team, SMART, domestic abuse response teams, DART, uh, which pair uh, specially trained police officers with mental health professionals or other specialized service providers. Right now, Los Angeles is exploring, as we all know, uh, additional alternatives to deploying officers for incidents that involve mental illness, homelessness, and other social and public service needs, public health needs. And it is important for that reason to understand the tools that we have been using, uh, un assess their uh, efficacy in those roles, and identify where we can improve upon them or edit them. So with that, uh, I want to go ahead and uh, so, uh, Commander Hamil Hamilton, are you going to be, no? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, actually, it's Commander Eskridge is going to address it along with uh, Lieutenant Muniz. Okay, so, okay. Uh, he okay. I just remained on from the Robert William Stewart presentation, ma'am. Okay, okay, great. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, so, Lieutenant Muniz and, uh, oh, I see uh, Commander Eskridge. Ernie, good to see you. It's been a while. And uh, just wanted to ask if you could please uh, provide more detail about the training that is conducted for these specialized tr uh, teams. Um, to begin, SMART units are paired, as you mentioned before, with a Department of Mental Health clinician. Each officer is required to go through our MHIT, which stands for Mental Health Intervention Training, uh, before they are deployed. Additionally, um, there's an interview process and some sort of vetting, if you will, in that we typically are looking for officers that have some patrol experience and have been able to do a variety of different uh, assignments before showing up to um, SMART, having some maturity. Um, they then, those officers are then paired with other senior officers and then they respond to calls so there's more training there until they're actually out on their own with the clinician. And then there's always the ongoing training. Every time you're working with a clinician, you get additional, you know, um, field-based training from there. So the, um, there's a case assessment management program? Correct. And uh, they typically receive the referrals from the SMART teams? Correct. Um, those uh, camp, as we call it, um, that section, if you were to equate it to a patrol unit, you have your field patrol units, and then you have detectives that then process those cases and see them through the court. This is a similar model, in, but in a mental health setting. You have SMART that goes out and responds to the calls real time. Um, those cases are then sent over to camp that tend to be longer term or where having them followed through with those detectives through the court system, maybe instead of a criminal outcome, having it be mandated um, mental health treatment is beneficial so that the behavior doesn't continue and the individual can, can improve. So yes, those, those referrals are coming generally from SMART. From time to time, they are from patrol. Um, if a SMART unit doesn't respond, patrol and even a command staff will will request a camp team to assess a case. And so approximately how many cases are currently being managed by camp? Um, they had, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now, but what I can tell you is um, in the last six months, they tend to handle cases that have um, threats of violence, ongoing threats of violence, we had uh, 55 suicide by cop cases that occurred in the last six months that they that is for camp. So those calls came out, and camp is following up on those cases from September to February. Their entire caseload, I don't, I don't have that data in front of me. Okay. 
And so when calls for service related to mental health are received, how are these calls identified? How are they issued uh, to the teams? If you can provide some of the kind of context of how, of what the workflow is, that would be helpful. Right. At the time of this request, SMART was dispatched to calls when requested by patrol. So for instance, if patrol got a call where there was mental health involved, patrol unit would neutralize the situation, have the individual um, in, in custody, and then they would request a smart unit, sometimes uh, for a barricade or somebody on an elevated platform where there's a little more time, uh, a smart unit would deploy at the time of the call. Um, as of February 8th, we've changed that model to not require a patrol unit to um, dispatch us. The communications is able to send us to a call um, at the same time as patrol. So um, the calls that meet that criteria are, are when the subject is violent, the subject is armed, and the public is at risk, a welfare check, the subject possibly committed a crime due to the mental illness, and the subject's behavior is high risk, as I mentioned before, something with it as a barricaded suspect or someone on an elevated platform. So um, we're able to respond directly to those calls and when possible, when travel time allows concurrently with the patrol unit. Okay, thank you so much. Colleagues, I wanna provide an opportunity for you all to ask any questions that you might have. I'm sure. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Thank Mr. you, thank you. Joe is fine, Joe is perfect. <laughs> Um, thank you, Lieutenant, for your report. Um, something from the frustrations that I had in the years out in the field is the long ETAs. The ETAs of requesting a SMART team, the ETA of requesting an MEU, Mental Evaluation Unit. It was brutal, brutal, because, you know, it was something that I wasn't, you know, tasked to do. And as I mentioned before, it, before this committee and, and – um, is that I was never trained to be a psychiatrist, psychologist. It's, it, I, wasn't, I wasn't trained in the academy. But it was very frustrating. We have a, a, a continued need, but we have to expand that and mobilize and expand that workforce. And how do we get there? Because uh, as of right now, if you look at these numbers, very, very, uh, these are just brutal numbers of how many people are out there responding to these calls. And this is why patrol end up responding to them, correct? Absolutely. Um, so in part, as I mentioned earlier, we have the mental health intervention training. So something that is of benefit is our patrol officers are going through this 40 hour mental health training. Um, so that is of help, but in answer to your, your comment on the response times, we're often fielding, one car per bureau per watch. So, one car? Uh, yes. One car. Wow. That's, that's what we're staffed for. Um, and, and who it, funds the, um, the the doctor or the professional uh, that works with the uh, alongside the police officer? Who funds that piece? The Department of Mental Health. Those yeah. are the Department of Mental Health staffing. So, so members, uh, and thank you, Lieutenant, for mm -hmm. one of your service free report. Uh, again, can you imagine if we had our own, own health department? We would have access to those dollars that we would have at control of the deployment of these resources. So frustrating. It's a shame. It's a shame. In the largest city in the county, in the state of California, we have one MEU unit per bureau. Of course, it's, it's, it's just an embarrassment. And who suffers the most? The individual that needs the most help. And oftentimes, the officers are the first responders. And they get caught up in putting handcuffs on someone who has n no idea what's going on because of the mental illness. I know we'll do better, but we've, we've got to do better. Well, and better. And agreed. Better. Agreed, Mr. Buscaino, and I know we have uh, an opportunity to fund uh, and hold accountable the county to actually provide an unarmed response that addresses with 
proper mental health professionals uh, that sadly still has not been prioritized for funding, but I'm hoping that together we can reconcile that immediately. Yep, um, with your leadership, Monica, I know this is important to, to you and to all of us. We're gonna get there. Yep, it's, 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 thank it's, you. Yeah, no, it's, it's unnecessary, but when you recognize what the need is and how that hasn't been addressed is just, uh, it's, uh, it's wrong. Uh, Mr. O'Farrell, I'm sorry, you had a question? Well, that's okay. I was just going to commiserate with uh, both you and, and Joe. Uh, I can easily envision how different it would be if we went our own way, especially as it relates to mental health. I mean, our own CAO today said that the county won't even give them a bed <laughs> it, when they find someone in distress who's having a mental health episode. Get to this position where the county won't even give us a bed for someone in distress who's homeless. So it might have worked just fine in 1968, but it does not work just fine in 2021. That's why we need to review this agreement uh, just thoroughly. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. De Leon. Thank you very much, uh, thank you very much uh, Madam Chair. And I just want to add my comments, you know, also to I, I think Mr. Busca, you know. Uh, said it very uh, poignantly that the bottom line is this, when he went to the academy, um, they didn't receive any psychological training. The bottom line is this, is that we're asking uh, too much of our LAPD uh, rank and file officers. They're not LCSWs, they're not MSWs, they have no psychological training at all whatsoever. So why would we expect to use them for every single social, you know, uh, challenge that we're facing as a society? Uh, it's unfortunate that um, the Department of Mental Health folks had to leave uh, for you know other business uh, during the uh, council meeting. It's my hope that we can have them come back so we can have a more thorough discussion. I know that Mr. Uh, Mitchell Farrell uh, was very, very passionate with regards to uh, his uh, con both commentaries as well as, as, as questioning. You know, if, if we have folks who are um, in, in, in deep in need of psychiatric you know care and, and observation, why call 911 in LAPD? Why put them in the back of a squad car? Why take them, you know, to 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 a, a, a detention center, or I should say, a, a, to jail in, in the city of LA when it's a psychological issue? The question becomes capacity-wise. We have a crisis city-wide, as we know. We don't have capacity because we don't have inventory, because we don't have stock, we don't have a supply with regards to housing, and whichever housing that's manifested. But is there a, a problem with the lack of psychiatric beds? Is there a problem with capacity? And therefore, when there is a 911 call, when someone is 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 having a psychotic breakdown and they need the help necessary, why involve our LAPD officers? And I know what's so deeply heartbreaking are the tragic stories that we have heard time and time again, with mothers or parents who have called, you know, 911, not knowing what to do exactly. A, 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 a young a uh, teenage, you know, teenager or young adult is having a, a, a psychotic breakdown and a tragedy ensues. And that's a combination of that, that volatile environment and not understanding the deep psychological, you know, needs. And we know that that's happened. And I think Mr. Marquis Harris Dawson has mentioned this on numerous occasions when it comes to black and brown communities, you know, how that is treated so dramatically different. If you have the financial wherewithal, uh, you have substance abuse issues combined with the mental health issues, then that, that, that privilege gives you access to treatment centers, whereas it's different, it's treated differently. So, you know, um, uh, much needed, and I'm hoping, you know, Madam Chair, if not through the council's hope, perhaps maybe through public safety, through your leadership as chair of the committee, we can have John Sharon and the folks from the Department of Mental Health come and, and so we can engage them in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, you know, and just uh, also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, very quickly how, sadly, the members of our Los Angeles Police Department have been charged with these responsibilities and responses uh, through the direction of policy adoption, not by their own selective uh, interest. Uh, and it's because of the absence of county health professionals and county stepping up and doing their job. And so, sadly, I just want to just kind of recognize that, again, these are the men and women of the department who have been put in a position to respond as a result of the absence of the appropriate 
resources coming from the county to, to address this. And I look forward to uh, reconciling that with uh, the uh, mental health vans and those that implementation citywide so that we can have that appropriate response. And, and just I know Mr. Harris Dawson has a question, but also quickly, colleagues, one of the uh, notable items that uh, I'm not sure if many of you caught uh, in our present in council this morning, but one of the items that was mentioned uh, with respect to LASA uh, and some of the responses related to mental health is um, the use of the sheriff's department in that in that work as well. And so, just to be mindful of you know just the applications and how they're consistent and utilized in terms of uh, policing resources uh, with respect to some of these issues, I think it's a uh, it's one to also consider and reflect on, Mr. Harris Dawson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I want to thank all the members uh, for uh, emphasizing the urgency of uh, this matter. I had a follow-up question for the Lieutenant uh, Muniz uh, around Mr. Buscaino's questions. He asked about ETA uh, and response time, and you indicated that there was one unit per bureau, I think, or station, uh, which is uh, appalling, uh, to say the least, given the need. But I just wondered, did you actually have a number in terms of what the typical response time is uh, when an officer uh, or a citizen calls for this unit? So let me clarify a bit. We, we maintain one unit per bureau. We run around 14 units a day right now. Um, and in part, that's because of some of the DMH staffing is not full. So we have to utilize officers to fill those other cars. Um, in terms of an actual number, I can't tell you precisely because our data systems don't calculate that the way it would for like a patrol division. But anecdotally, I can tell you it probably is about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get to a call on average. What has changed though is with this Thank new for that. response model, we, the reason we changed the model here on February 8th is so that we're not waiting for patrol to deal with the call and then call us. So that response time is then shortened. But depending on where you are in a place like the Valley, it still could be quite lengthy. Um, yeah, thank you for that. That's important. Uh, you know, obviously three or four is, I, I don't even need to comment on, on that. I, I just, you know, I have in front of me, there's so many cases uh, where this becomes an issue um, and, and a really deadly issue. Uh, so there's the, there is the category of people that Mr. De Leon talked about that don't get the help they need. And, you know, they, they either leave the scene in 45 minutes and they don't get treatment or they stay and they don't get treatment. Uh, but then there are the people where officers are put in the position where they end up making the decision to end someone's life. Um, just this past November, we paid out about $2 million to a family where a man had a knife, and the security guard at the mall called for the mental health unit. Officers arrived. They got there and called for the mental health unit. And a whole bunch of time passed and the situation escalated. And they ended up uh, uh, taking, a sh taking a shot. So it's, this is a, um, one of these issues that we've got to deal with a, with a, with a good amount of urgency. And, and uh, in fact, I would argue the most urgency that we have. Uh, we know it, it, it's just basic science. When we have a street and we know so many people are going down it, we put a stoplight or we put a stop sign so people can be safe. We know we have people with mental health conditions on the street. We know when we release them from prison. We know when they have an episode and we release them on their own recognizance. We know they're out there uh, and we know what they're likely to do uh, and the situations they're likely to be in. And uh, unfortunately, we just haven't uh, haven't responded and we put our police department in front of these folks and say you deal with it uh and then some of them so i'm uh, i'll own this some of us get mad when it's handled uh poorly or not handled in in um in the best way and uh it's just not it's not fair to anybody it's not fair to the victim it's not fair to the officers it's not fair to the society and so we got to do better i thank you madam chair for uh, continuing to be the tip of the spear on this issue as it relates to our police department. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I do want to also cover still um, some of the other specialized units that uh, that are also serving in these very critical roles. Um, 
you know, I, I think it was a huge shift in um, the way we approach, uh, you know, with domestic violence, uh, with the work of the DART teams and uh, the sensitive nature of that work. And, and uh, if you could kind of just provide an overview on DART and how they, you know, how they coordinate with the DV service provider in the area, at what point they're deployed, um, and then uh, just the, you know, how those calls are identified and dispatched uh, by uh, by 911, if you could just provide an overview of that. Um, is, that, is Commander Eskridge on? Um, Council Member <clears throat> Rodriguez, um, I wasn't sure that this was going to be presented by us. But nevertheless, DART has a um, officer and an advocate at each geographic division, and they respond to um, domestic violence calls and, and address any calls and provide services and referrals um, to those services from that particular location. Um, we also have a couple of locations, one in the valley, as well as the Stewart House, in which um, it's a one-stop shop. And... Uh, where our victims can get uh, multiple um, services at that location. So because we do have um, a DART officer as well as an advocate at each geographic division, it is very helpful in uh, intervening and providing services to the victims and addressing those issues. Okay, thank you. And, and finally, I just wanted to ask, on uh, with respect to the HOPE teams, I know those are uh, coming offline or... What are the roles and how, in terms of how they're being uh, carried out today? Um, it's my understanding of the HOPE team in general was disbanded. Um, when we had them in South Bureau, they were very effective, of course, that they responded to several different calls as well as ha handled, sanita dealt with sanitation issues. Now we have our patrol officers that are responding um, and dealing with certain issues or the captains at various geographic divisions, they're addressing uh, homeless issues, homeless encampments, and you also have your senior lead officers who are basically the chiefs of their area that are addressing those issues. So they're taking on those additional challenges and the senior lead officer, uh, uh, on most cases, they know exactly what's going on in the areas. They know the homeless um, people that are there as well. So we're providing them with services and addressing issues and coordinating um, with the community members and stakeholders as well as our council districts. And thank you so much, Commander. And I, I was, was it, uh, I don't know if it was at all the divisions, but as I recall, many of the senior lead officers did do a, uh, uh, you know, a short stint with the HOPE teams, right, in training. Uh, yes, so absolutely. They were, in some cases, they would um, go out with the HOPE teams and address various issues. Um, or trash cleanups and what have you and uh, a slow for a particular area where they were having an issue would address that issue in their area and that's how they would address those issues as well to assist the whole units. Okay, terrific. Um, colleagues, were there any additional questions? No? Seeing none? Oh, uh, Lieutenant, did you, I saw you raise your little virtual hand. I don't know if that was an accident. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I was just going to add that um, for the mental evaluation unit, we have four senior leads, and even though our mission is crisis response, not homeless outreach, we still partner with DMH and the home team, and the senior leads for SMART help facilitate a relationship between the senior leads at the patrol divisions and the DMH home. So as DMH is attempting to uh, address some of the chronically homeless um, and conservators, the field conservatorship program, um, we're also facilitating that and being that liaison for the area senior leads. Terrific. Thank you so much. And uh, colleagues, seeing no additional questions, I'm going to go ahead and recommend that we note and file the report. And uh, Commander and Lieutenant, thank you very much. Stay thank well. You, Appreciate you. you. Thank you very much. Take care. And colleagues, that now brings us to items 11, 12, and 13 on today's agenda. Madam Chair, before you move on, can I call the roll for item number four? Excuse me, sorry, jumping the 
jumping ahead. Go ahead. Not a problem. Uh, calling the roll for note and file on item number four, Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. Council Member De Leon. Aye. And Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Five ayes. This item is approved. Would you like me to read 11 through 13 into the record, Madam Chair? Please. Item number 11 is a Board of Police Commissioners report relative to the payment of a $25,000 reward offered to the claimant in connection with the conviction of the driver in a hit and run case on July 16, 2018. Item 12 is a Board of Police Commissioners report relative to the payment of a $25,000 reward offered divided among claimants 1, 2, and 3 in connection with the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for the severe injury felony hit and run case on August 22, 2019. And item number 13 is a Board of Police Commissioners report relative to the payment of a $25,000 reward offered to the claimant in connection with the arrest and conviction of the driver responsible for the severe injury felony hit and run case on May 19, 2019. Thank you so much. And colleagues, for these items, we just need to revise the recommendations to include uh, the appropriate transfer instructions. Uh, so the recommendations for each item should read as follows. Approve the payment of a $25,000 reward. Authorize the controller to transfer $25,000 from the reserve fund to the unappropriated balance and appropriate therefrom to the hit and run reward program fund number 59G. Instruct the city clerk to transfer $25,000 from the hit and run reward program fund number 59G, account number to be determined to the Los Angeles Police Department fund number 100, department 70, secret service account number 4310. Instruct the LAPD to make the appropriate reward payment and authorize the LAPD and the city clerk to make any technical corrections as necessary. And I move that we adopt these items as amendment as amended. Second. Thank you, Mr. Buscaino. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Calling the roll to approve items 11 through 13 as verbally amended to include financial instructions. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. Council Member Buscaino. This makes my heart happy to see these rewards come through. Uh, yes, yes, aye. Council Member De Leon. Aye. And Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Five ayes. These items are approved as amended. Thank you so much. Madam Clerk, uh, I believe we've cleared the desk. That is correct, Madam Chair. Terrific. Colleagues, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Our meeting is adjourned.